Good evening, um, everybody. Um, let's start the um, fourth uh, Lighthouse talk, which uh, Faculty of Graduate Studies is doing uh, to support the research students and to uh, those who are interested in, um, in the world of research uh, that we want to promote uh, students to engage in research more and more. Uh, so first of all, let, let me thank um, Dr. Rasika Jayatilaka on behalf of the Faculty of Graduate Studies, University of Moratua for accepting the invitation to be our guest speaker for the day. And uh, so let me uh, introduce her briefly uh, before I hand over the, um, the audience to you. Uh, Dr. Rasika Jayatilaka is from University of Colombo and uh, she has um, a first class honors in uh, in uh, Bachelor of Science First Class Honours in, math in Mathematics, specialized in Statistics from University of Colombo. Then she has proceeded to um, uh, Virginia, USA, where she has uh, done both her Master's and PhD in Statistics from the Old Dominion University from Norfolk. And um, so specializing in uh, Bayesian Statistics and Bayesian Computations, uh, she has interest, uh, a wider interest, uh, range of interest from in the biostatistics area now, and also works in statistical bioinformatics and genomics. Also, her specialization this is continuing with interest in the Bayesian statistics and Bayesian computations. Also, uh, going up to like data science, and she will be uh, speaking to us about um, from the design to. Um, uh, on the stats and uh, specifically enlightening you on the um, the importance of it and how to plan initially. Uh, with that, I'll hand over uh, to Dr. Rasika. Over to you, Dr. Rasika. Welcome thank and you. thank you. Thank you, Professor Ajay. So uh, let me start uh, sharing my screen. Yeah. So as uh, Professor Ajit mentioned, so uh, I want to give a small uh, talk on what is statistics uh, role in research. So actually when uh, I was contacted by Ms. Kim Hani, uh, she told me like, can you speak a little bit about uh, sample size calculation? And I thought a little bit about it and realized that if I jump straight into uh, uh, sample size calculation, maybe uh, I'm, not give, I'm not doing justice. So I thought like, let me just introduce you to why statistics is important and why you should give it uh, a little bit more thought, not as an uh, afterthought. So let me see. Okay. Right. So not as an afterthought, uh, so that uh, you understand why it is very important that you get the uh, e uh, importance of incorporating statistical methods into your research. Right. So that's why I said from design to conclusion, I will uh, try my best to give you a glimpse of what statistics is uh, doing. So moving on to next. So, um, so I thought uh, as the outline for our talk today, uh, the different stages of research in the way that I uh, think are as stages and also uh, to uh, talk to you about how statistics get involved in different aspects. Now, so you know that study design, you had to think, uh, you might uh, wonder why do I need to incorporate statistic or think about statistic at study design. So I hope during this talk, you realize uh, you would understand why that is. And of course, uh, request was to talk more about the sample size calculation. So I will talk more on that. Uh, and then a little bit about analysis and how to uh, give the conclusions. So uh, all of this, the, I believe that the main uh, reason why we should be very careful in the way we design, collect data and give our conclusion is because uh, we try to give a conclusion for more uh, generalized, more uh, broader uh, aspect, right? So when I make a claim that I discovered through my research this, then anybody should be able to go through the steps that you have gone through and be able to see the same results. So this is what we call as reproducibility of research. So it has become a hot topic uh, lately because a lot of people publish a lot of data on various topics, but uh, they don't realize that sometimes there are 
uh, research designs are so narrow that it cannot be reproduced or there is a lot of error that uh, doesn't give somebody else the chance to replicate and see the same results. So I hope if we do actually follow a lot of or put a lot of thoughts into uh, the statistical aspects, I'm pretty sure that our research that we produce has um, more reproducibility, therefore more validity. So uh, this may sound a little bit cliche because I, I, want, I thought it's good to go back to uh, and ask ourselves what is research uh, because that is uh, because it plays or it uh, gives us the idea of what we do and what we need to do, right? So, um, so if I just googled and uh, saw a uh, two or uh, definitions here, so I think the first one is what comes to your mind uh, when you say research. So we know that uh, as a scientific communi community, uh, there is a very grave importance on research, right? So what we try to do is we use our existing knowledge to gain new knowledge. So we do that in a very creative, very innovative way. So uh, that's what actually you think is research because you're, you come from different areas. So maybe uh, chemical engineering, civil engineering, maybe some are also here in like an MBA kind of uh, degrees. So uh, you have your uh, field of study. So there's methodology uh, that, uh, that is fixed to your field. So you are more, when you start a research, you think about those things and doesn't sometimes even understand what statistics has to do with your field or your research. So, but the thing is, when you do a research, you always try to make a claim, right? So you say like, okay, I have come up with this new product that uh, supersedes everything else out there, right? So as an engineer, you might want to come up with a new invention and you want to claim that invention is superior to what is existing. So how do you show your superiority, right? How do you show the superiority of your product? Then you have to, produce evidence. You have to present them in a manner that is scientifically accepted. You can't do that ad hocly and then make the claim, right? So that's mix. That's where you need to uh, collect data. You need to design uh, so that this is more scientific and it has more uh, rigor, right? And that every anybody who reproduce it can see the same results. So that's in a way, research is the systematic inquiry into the collection of data, documentation, your information, and then analysis as well as interpretation. Now, all of a sudden, this statistic analysis data has come into picture, which you have may or may not have thought beforehand. So that's why I think as postgraduates, uh, right, uh, your courses must have at least some uh, research methodology course or statistics course. And this is included into the curricula because of these reasons, right? And uh, so this is uh, what I perceive as uh, different aspects of uh, research. Of course, these are not uh, the normal or the established one. This is what I have come up. So, uh, and I want to uh, give emphasis to these aspects because they play or influence how you do the statistical analysis or how the statistics plays uh, uh, vice versa. So the first thing is for you to set the objective. Uh, I have seen uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting things about this objective because uh, first thing we ask anybody who is doing a research is why are you doing the research, right? Some students say, okay, I want to do a survey. Now in my field, we are statisticians. So when I ask, I want to do a survey, or I want to an, uh, use this method, or like that the, uh, students, or even some, I mean, mainly students give that kind of answers. But that is not an objective, right? Objective would be for you to have some interesting idea on from your field, and you're trying to prove that, or you're trying to gather information to support it. So you have to come up with the objective clearly, and we'll come to that in a bit as well. Then of course, you'll be doing review of existing knowledge. 
now this is sometimes called as literature review so when you are doing this review it's good to uh, not just to review uh, you know the theory or the uh, theoretical aspects that is related to your objective but also to look at how they have collected data how have they analyzed their data what analytical aspects have they considered so is there gaps in there so that you can fill them or you can learn from them and uh, improve your research so don't just um, pay attention to the methodology aspect that relates to your field but also give some um, time to review the analytics the data analytics that they have done then of course moving on you will go to the methodology uh, so in there we have a lot of the sample size calculation is also going to come as part of the methodology so it basically will tell you how you're going to do the research to achieve the objective <laughs> Then, of course, you will collect the data and you will analyze. So obviously, you I don't think we need to uh, wonder how statistics plays uh, a role in data collection and analysis. <clears throat> right. So as I mentioned, the objective sets the pace for your research, right? It sets the foundation. So most of you would start with very broad objectives. So uh, it's OK, because we, as uh, no, I would say, as early researchers, uh, you all are very uh, motivated and optimistic. So you want to uh, kind of uh, uh, have a very big impact through your research. So you have very broad objectives. But what I would like you all to think is, uh, think about the time frame, think about the resources you have, and then try to break down your objectives to more manageable objectives, especially because these objectives in the end, uh, one way or the other, has to be matched to a hypothesis test or a, 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 a statistical analysis basis. So uh, if you have very broader objects with you, like, OK, I want to um, find the pollution level in, uh, say, uh, Bere Lake then how do I do that? Uh, or if I want to find the arsenic level in rice, can how can I do that? So can I, uh, do I have time and resources to investigate all types of rice coming from everywhere? Uh, or can I just uh, look at Bere Lake at every, uh, I mean, different time points in a year? Uh, am I going to look at different uh, places to collect the sample? So like that, you, your broader objectives may have to be uh, uh, more focused and more specific, okay? So you think about the objective and uh, set it very clearly so that you don't change it from time to time, right? Or at least if you're changing it, your initial uh, uh, objective doesn't change, right? Initial reason for the research doesn't change. Then you then when now when a statistician comes to help you or when you uh, think of this in statistical point of view, we look at the objective and try to decide what this research is all about. Is it trying to estimate a population characteristic? So if you're thinking about Berry Lake, you might uh, you're trying to establish the uh, pollution level, right? So you're trying to you so your population is the entire Berry Lake and you want to uh, we are trying to estimate a population characteristic of it. Or you may be trying to find correlations, right? Uh, trying to uh, establish correlations, for example. Uh, so you have, uh, let's say, I, I don't know how much of this is related to engineering, but these are some of the things that I find we can all relate. So let's say we have arsenic levels in rice, we want to find that out. So we may ask like not just the estimation of arsenic level, but also like what what uh, other aspects are related to the different levels of arsenic in rice. So we are trying to establish correlation. So you know, like some people. So when you see uh, uh, objective status like factors associated, then we know that you're trying to find the correlations in your data in your re, through your research right but if you say factors affect you know impact of a certain thing on uh, a response then you are trying to establish causation so i'll talk about this correlation causation but 
think about the difference in in even this small one word difference means entirely different thing and the way the statisticians try to uh, approach that and analyze data is going to also differ then you might want to do a comparative study for example as i said as engineers you might come up with a new invention and you may want to show that your invention is better than the leading competitor or standard method out there then you are doing a comparative study so you have to state that and once you once we identify this then we can uh, think about what's the design etc so uh, so as i mentioned so looking at your objective we will this we can decide what main type of study you're going to do for example you might be wanting to do an observational one uh, where you just collect the data and uh, present the status of it or you may want to do an experiment so you're trying to prove that yours is better than what is out there or something causes some uh, uh, result like that you might want to uh, adopt an experimental approach or you want to find optimal conditions that gives uh, the best uh, production in a, a production process sometimes uh, there are studies we call that simulation studies because we can't experimentally or physically do experiments because they may be novel uh, they may be like theoretical uh, 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 research that you're doing so to uh, prove those things you may be doing simulation so actually uh, whether you do any one of those things uh, you may want to consider about your sample sizes then we may also want to ask ourselves uh, what data are we going to collect so as i mentioned when you have the objective set you will you will also be able to understand what is your main variable of interest is it just a single variable is it multiple mm. variables Variable. Right. So, uh, so you might want to uh, find the information needed. So now, for example, if you are talking about uh, Barry Lake and you are looking at the pollution level, so are you just going to collect the sample and then analyze and present the averages, or are you going to relate this to uh, different? places like what are the characteristics of the places that you collected the samples from right uh, if you are doing an experiment on your new invention so you might want to uh, control your environment right it, it needs to be done maybe in a controlled environment so then what are the characteristics of the uh, controls that you have done so uh, so those things you may want to think so and you can think of these as uh, additional information that you're collecting that you will be using to maybe establish causation or correlation. Then you want to uh, think about, now when I say about the data, so when you think about what data to calculate, uh, collect, that also gives you an idea of possible analysis that we can expect. We don't know, of course, beforehand, these are exactly uh, what we are going to use to analyze data but it gives you an idea and you can work out your research uh, design in a much more comprehensive way then uh, you're talking about how to collect data right then uh, what tools you can use so if you're doing something like a survey then you are uh, may, may want to talk about a questionnaire or setting up a questionnaire right then uh, then what data to collect Play, comes again and you can think about what to include, what questions to ask in your questionnaire. Uh, and if, uh, if it is an experimental study, we have uh, concepts called blocking. So what are the external factors that you need to control, right? Uh, what is the replication? What is the randomization procedure? So all those things comes into picture when, when during this method, when establishing your methodology for the research. Then, of course, we have the sample size calculations. So you can see that all these things needed to be thought very carefully because the data, once you collect the data, uh, while well, next step is to analyze. But if you collect data uh, in a haphazard way, there is no amount of analysis we can do to rectify or salvage that data. So if you think from your objective, 
to what type of study, what, what are you trying to do, what type of study then you should adopt, uh, what information to collect and how to collect, then you're, there's only a small chance that you can go wrong. Right, so before we proceed, I just think it's important that we all understand that correlation does not imply causation, right? I think uh, this is something all of you know by now. If not, I would like you all to uh, be very careful of what you can and cannot do in certain uh, study designs, right? Now, if you're talking about correlation, uh, if you had done uh, surveys or something we call as case control studies, or you use secondary data, what you have done is you have gone and collected data, asked questions, or observed of the status, current status of a process, right? So you have not uh, adjusted, you have not controlled and changed one variable to see the impact of the other. You don't know uh, whether some of these, like for example, uh, you might uh, think, okay, there's high level of pollution in Bere. That is because of uh, uh, a, a plant that is close by. We do not know whether even before the plant uh, was established, the, uh, the manufacturing plant was established, we don't know what was the uh, condition in the Bere level, Bere Lake, right? So there's no temporal uh, relationship we can uh, established just by going and collecting observational studies. So if you want to talk about causation, then you have to think about cohort studies, experiments, and you have to go a little bit more, you have to do a lot of things to say causation, but, uh, uh, but co establishing correlation risk, uh, uh, on the other hand is much easier. So I, I what I want to, uh, reiterate or emphasize here is that if you're doing surveys or case control studies or observational study, remember the maximum that you can say is or establish our correlation, not causation. So don't uh, say at the end, um, I have discovered uh, that this X causes Y, right? Uh, that is wrong because if you had collected data, not through experiment, not through a cohort study, but through these uh, observational studies. So we come to the main request of the talk, that is the sample size. So I have to give you a warning that uh, uh, if you're here to, uh, you know, write down a magical formula that fits all uh, your pro uh, research needs, I hate to disappoint you, there is no such thing, right? So sample size calculation is interesting and at the same time, very challenging, even for statistician, because a lot of things uh, plays uh, a role and uh, the complicated the research is going to be, it's not going to be very simple to uh, calculate these sample sizes. So for, uh, for uh, so, just, this is because I am introducing you this concept and I am, trying to uh, tell you why these uh, different aspects needs to be considered even in the sample size calculation. I have picked the, uh, I, ha I too have not picked any uh, complicated one, but very basic and uh, very often used formulas to uh, describe what the sample size calculations are. So now the question is, why do we need sample size calculations? Uh, mainly is because we are using a sample not a population. If you have access to the entire population, then there's nothing wrong. You're not even making estimates. You're actually uh, finding out the real value of your population parameters, right? So uh, because we can't access the entire population and we are taking a sample, what more over that is that we use the findings we observe from the sample or we discover from the sample to the population. We are trying to generalize it. So now the problem is if your sample is not a good representation or is not good enough, then it's your generalizability of findings is, is going to be questionable. So that's when uh, people go and you know claim all sorts of, and I think even the COVID situation 
uh, we have heard a lot of claims, right? A lot of uh, concussions coming up and claiming to give a lot of uh, remedy, I mean, claiming to be the remedy. But you have to think about whether that is generalizable, whether it is applicable to a larger population or not. So that's why we need these kind of testing and we need uh, the research to go into it, right? So now, because we have such limited resources, especially if you're uh, a student uh, and you're, you don't have like uh, grants, you're doing the research on your own or your grant is not in millions, right? Your resources are very limited. So you tend to keep uh, the required sample or the number of subjects that you need to consider in your experiment or your uh, survey to a minimum. Now, the problem when you what happens is when you have too few units is that sometimes when you especially in comparative studies like group a versus group b what happens is if there is an actual difference between say group a and group b you're not going to be able to detect that difference because you have used too few units and it is going to introduce large variance and because of all those things, you may not be able to come up with significant results, you know, like rejecting H naught, it's not significant. That uh, conclusion you may see, not because that there is no difference between group A and group B, but because you took too few units to study for your sample. So that's a very, uh, I think, setback to uh, your research area because you do actually have something very interesting to produce, but you're unable to show it, right? Then too many uh, is wonderful if we can have as many as we want, but the problem is it's going to be a waste of resources and time to have taken more than what is necessary. Now in uh, medicine, that's what I am mostly familiar with. It, is, uh, it poses unethical issues of exposing people to uh, studies when you don't have to expose that many. So now we need to strike a balance between taking too few units to taking too many so that we, we don't, we have to come to a compromise and that's where the sample size calculations comes into uh, rescue. So when we are talking about sample sizes, you can see that uh, you all the formulas that we are going to see are going to need some inputs. So, uh, so I say that sample size calculation depends on several uh, facts. One is what type of measure are you going to focus on? So I said like in the objective, you might think about, okay, I'm going to study the pollution level in Bayre. So the main measure is pollution level. Then you have to ask, how do you measure that? Right? So maybe you have to take a few uh, different uh, measurements, bring it into an uh, index, and then that index would become your uh, measure of interest. If you're talking about, say, something like satisfaction level, then you're talking about a proportions, uh, uh, the proportion that is satisfied versus the proportion that is not satisfied. Then the second one is, when you have this measure, there's always going to be an inherent or an underlying variability in the measure in the population. So we have to have, unfortunately, this is quite challenging. We need to have an idea of the variability of this measure. Then the third one is the hypothesis you're testing. Especially, you know, that when it comes to hypothesis test, I hope all of you are somewhat familiar. You have the null and the, you have the alternative. So that is going to play a part in your sample size calculations as well. Then you have to, uh, so following from the hypothesis test, you have the type one error and uh, opposite to that is power. Uh, so type one error and power also needs to uh, be mentioned or uh, stated in the calculation, right? Then effect size or margin of error is the other way around. So let me just. Uh, uh, right. So uh, warning I want to give is that calculation of sample sizes is not, as I mentioned, is not an easy task. Uh, it's 
well, the more complicated your research is or methodology is going to be, the complicated, uh, we, we have to take into account a lot of uh, aspects, right? And the more aspects that you have to take into account, uh, you cannot uh, uh, stick to very basic formulas. Right. So the comparative, uh, so I'll start with the sample size calculations that are uh, there for comparative studies. So uh, this is mainly important if you are comparing uh, one or more group, uh, two or more groups actually. Uh, so uh, again, uh, because of complexity, uh, I am going to stick to two group comparisons. Uh, and uh, so again, you want to ask how you're going to compare the groups. Are you going to compare them based on their average of the response or the measure of uh, interest? Or is it the proportion uh, you're going to use? Or is it the variance? So depending on which way or which statistic you're going to use to compare these groups, your uh, formula that you select to calculate the sample size is going to change. Right, so I mentioned that hypothesis also plays a major role. Why is that is uh, you have the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. So any test, uh, now your objective uh, is uh, gone into smaller, I mean, more specific objectives. And the, those specific objectives can be translated into a hypothesis test, right? So in that hypothesis test, uh, you will uh, have a null and an alternative, and the alternative hypothesis can be uh, one-sided or two-sided, right? Depending on what goes into the claim. I hope uh, this is something you are familiar with. Uh, for example, you might want to compare the means, right? And uh, this is what your null hypothesis would be. And the alternative is that uh, we simply want to prove that there is a difference. Right? So you can see the alternative has the unequal sign. Maybe you want to show the superiority. So you have that, right? So likewise, depending on what you have for your alternative, the sign is going to change. And depending on that, you're going to uh, realize or you're going to uh, say your test is a two-sided or a one-sided test. So when you conduct a hypothesis test, uh, now the this hypothesis testing plays a pivotal role in uh, uh, sample size calculation because it is actually either in the estimation or through these hypothesis tests that we uh, we we actually formulate these formula or we derive these formulas. Now when you have hypothesis test, you you do one or one of these, what is that? Is that you either reject your null hypothesis uh, in the favor of your alternative, or you don't reject the null hypothesis. So these are very simple uh, hypothesis test rules that you know. But when you are doing that, you can see there's a chance of making two types of error. I am thinking that maybe you all are familiar with this type one, type two error. If not, this is just to refresh. Uh, so the one error you can make is that uh, what we can also call as false positive. So you're saying something is significant. It's like you're saying your new uh, invention is better than uh, the existing invention, uh, but actually there's no difference. So you're claiming something that does not exist to be significant, right? The other aspect of that is you're failing to reject the null hypothesis when it's false. You do actually have a, a significant difference between your invention and what is uh, standard, but you, uh, for some reason, maybe you haven't collected the data or there is some underlying reason for it, but you fail to reject the null hypothesis and you say that there is no difference. So both are very significant errors in terms of uh, research right so uh, actually out of these uh, i think researchers are more concerned about this making type one error 
and the probability of time one error is what you are familiar as significance level right so we try to keep the significance level to a minimum as much as possible and then we look at the type 2 error in terms of uh, power of the test so we call the probability of type 2 error as beta and 1 minus beta is the power of the test so uh, so you uh, so what we do is we try to set a value to alpha and change the value of beta and see how the sample size vary so usual practice is because of all these connection is when you have a research claim try to word is at much as, at much, much as possible uh, so that your research claim become the alternative hypothesis so in that way when you're rejecting the null or failing to reject the null you're actually saying whether you have evidence to support the claim or not enough evidence to support the claim right so keep that also in mind so you can see that uh, all these are because of the statistical analysis that even the way you word your research claim makes a difference so we come to the first uh, formula so here is the formula that is there to compare uh, means of two independent population maybe most of you have seen some version of this this is a little bit more uh, generalizable formula uh, you can see that uh, this formula will give you uh, the total sample size necessary so we may want to kind of uh, find out whether mu a is equal to mu b versus that they are not equal to each other right uh, then uh, and so that means we need we are talking about two groups that's why it says two population uh, a group and b group so, uh, so we may want we, what we want to do is take a sample out of this and take a sample out of this or maybe uh, we have we want to assign a treatment or uh, a method or b method uh, to two groups and check whether there is a difference so those are the ways we can uh, conduct we may come across this kind of uh, hypothesis test now if i want to uh, if i break down what is there in this formula uh, you can take equal sample sizes for these two groups so we call this as balanced or equal uh, design uh, equal sample size design so that's the most desirable one because that gives a lot of optimum uh, conditions for uh, mathematical analysis or statistical analysis but there can be instances where we want to have different uh, values for uh, group a uh, sample sizes for group a and group b so in that case we want to give the ratio between uh, n1 and n2 so this ratio is what is uh, actually denoted by the q uh, letters q1 and q2 so if they are equal this reduces to 4 if they are not equal then we will have some value so the optimal condition or the minimum condition uh, sample size is actually obtained when we have one to one ratio right then you can see that uh, we have z alpha over 2 z beta so these actually has uh, to do with uh, the critical value we read from the standard normal distribution so remember here we are trying to compare means uh, in statistics we have and maybe some of you are also familiar with the central limit theorem so in central limit theorem we know that the sample means uh, tend to follow a normal distribution uh, with the mean uh, as same as the population and the variance sigma squared over n so actually we you make use of that central limit theorem and we can assume that uh, we can actually read up these critical values from the uh, standard normal and this alpha and beta comes from your type uh, significance level or probability of type 1 error and the power of the test so you can decide uh, you know alpha change the value for beta and see what happens well, how the sample size changes so uh, you don't need to if you don't have any idea of what beta should be 
then you can try a few methods. But remember, uh, uh, beta is, uh, you want to keep beta to a minimum or more likely you have to take one minus beta or the power. So we had to talk about the power. So power of the test is one minus beta, that is not to make type two error. So we want our tests to have a high probability of being able to reject the null hypothesis when it is false. So uh, take so keep the idea and pick up the values you want, right? Now, in addition to that, we have two more uh, parameters. We have a sigma and a delta. So I'll talk, so where am I going to get the values for these and what are they? Now, uh, effect size is what is delta over here is called. So now remember we want, I hope you can hear me, <clears throat> right. Uh, so effect size is the smallest difference we would expect to see between the groups A and the groups B. Right, so we know that uh, we, in the alternative, we are saying that these two are not the same. If they are not the same, then what is the uh, expected difference you are trying to see? So this actually goes as your delta. So you can think of this as the expected improvement you have in your uh, invention over the others, or you can think about uh, the, uh, so what do you mean by a difference? in the two groups, right? So, so uh, that is the value. So now a lot of times uh, in, in a, as a statistician, a uh, lot of researchers come and ask us to do a sample size calculation and they don't have much idea about this. So uh, obviously uh, this is something you need to put a little bit of thought. You don't want this value to be too big either. You think of this uh, formula. Uh, look at uh, delta, right? What happens if delta is uh, small, right? Well, ideally, if if uh, now now when we let's say we come up with an invention, right, and we compare it with the standard, right? Uh, unless our invention is uh, breakthrough one, uh, the difference between the new and the standard may be very small. Right, so delta may be very strong. Uh, so we can go to delta could be very small, right? So uh, unless you have quite amount of confidence to say no, I can see a very. I expect to see a large difference between the two methods. Now the other one is like, for example, let's say you know, like these days, hot topic is organic farming and inorganic farming, right? So you, you might want to find out like arsenic levels in inorganic farming and uh, organic farming, right? So are we going to see a very huge difference in arsenic level, like zero to 100? Or are we going to expect a small difference? And we want to be able to show that at least this small subtle difference exists. Now, the problem with uh, small differences is the smaller this delta becomes, right, the higher your sample size is going to be. So if we suspect a huge difference, which is a breakthrough, right, then we don't need to show a lot of, we don't need to get uh, high sample sizes. So we don't need to get the information from large number of uh, individuals to show the uh, difference or to uh, do this hypothesis test. But if the uh, delta, the expected difference is minimum or very small, then we have to collect a lot of data to prove our story. Now, the next one is a variability of the measure. So pay attention to this sigma. So this is the variability of the measurement in the population. Now you can see, again, if this value is larger, we are going to end up having to take large sample size. So again, we need to make sure that we are giving a proper value that is not too high and, and also not too low. So how do I find this sigma? Because I am doing something totally new. How do I then find this? So that's why I said like when you do a literature review, do pay attention to what others have done because you might get information you need 
uh, from past studies for your sigma value. So this is like, for example, if it is arsenic level, so maybe in other countries, people have published uh, arsenic levels with the standard deviations. You can, so if you can relate that to your uh, study, you can use it as a basis, as a starting point. Or one thing you can do is to do a pilot study. So you know that you can do pilot studies, uh, not, I mean, in surveys that is very typical. Uh, what we do for pilot, like why we do pilot studies is to make sure that our questionnaires are okay and we uh, do it properly. We are trained to do the questionnaire, collect the data properly. But on the other side of things, when it comes to sample size calculation, doing a small pilot study would give us the limited data we can use to uh, get the value for parameters like sigma, right? So that's very important. So don't make your sigma, hopefully your sigma is not too large, but don't make it unnecessarily small. Unnecessarily small means you're implying the variability of your measure is very, very low, which can be quite uh, a, a, a hard thing to believe, right? Then, uh, now I mentioned that the hypothesis also plays a major role, right? Uh, so if you have uh, not equal sign, then this would have got a alpha over two. But if you had for your alternative, a greater than, a less than or a greater than sign, then this becomes a one-sided test. So in the formula, instead of alpha over two, you have to use alpha. So it's a very subtle change, but that can also add to the uh, correct calculation of the sample size. Right. So uh, just to go to the next formula. So I know it's a, I, I may, I'm hoping that you are still with me and not intimidated by these big formulas. But what I want to say is here is uh, another sample size calculation formula. But this is for the proportions. Right. So you can see now P1, P2 kind of parameters are entering. So now this is like your sigma in a way. So you need, you're trying to compare two groups. So you need to have some idea of what this group's proportion is going to be. So you can say, uh, this is the satisfaction level, right? The proportion satisfied in company A versus proportion of customers satisfied at company B, right? So uh, again, you can run a pilot study and get some values for this. Uh, and apply it to the formula. So delta again is how much difference you are trying to see between these two groups and that you need to specify, right? Uh, and one thing I want to mention here is this formula has something nice. That is, if we don't know anything about any of these, you can always plug in 0.5 because 0.5 is the one value we would use when no information is available to us. So this would give uh, a maximum uh, sample size. So we say it's a very uh, uh, liberal number you can use, right? So again, this is also a formula you can use uh, for you to, if the uh, objective is to compare population proportion. So let me just check uh, on, yeah. Right, so I have about 10 minutes left, am I clear? Yeah, so um, for survey type of studies, now the thing is different. We are not trying to compare. We are trying to uh, correctly identify maybe the average pollution level, uh, average uh, length of time of an uh, item or average defect uh, or the defect proportion or the tensile strength of uh, cables that is used. Uh, or even some things very simple like height uh, of, say, students or satisfaction. So we are trying to uh, find out the value of this, estimate the value. So it, that is the main idea behind the surveys we do most of the time. So now the sample size needs to be such that it allows us to obtain the accurate estimates of these measures, okay? Right, so this is, uh, if the estimate is a proportion, right? So for example, the uh, proportion of customers that are satisfied or the defect rates, then 
uh, and we have an infinite, very large population, then we use this uh, given uh, formula. Right? Now, the one, now there are the formula is nice and easy to uh, understand. It looks it's very short, and a few things needs to be entered. So p again is the uh, uh, prevailing probability we think could exist in the population. Again, this is something we have to find out from a pilot study, or we can plug in 0.5 if nothing is available. But here we assume that our sampling technique, that's the way we uh, uh, select subjects to our sample from the population is simple random sampling. So again, when that sampling method slightly change, this is going to be a little bit complicated, right? Now in here, the new term we see is E, which is the margin of error. So we know that we are trying to estimate the value or the characteristic, which is the proportion. So the estimate we get from our sample will not be exactly the same as the population value. So how much uh, error can I tolerate? How much error am I willing to take in my estimates compared to the population value? So that is a very bluntly or very simply put forward. That is what margin of error is. Right, what is the maximum likely difference between the observed estimate and the true value? So you, the smaller this is, I'm telling, I'm being uh, more uh, more conservative and less liber liberal. So the smaller this is, the better. But the problem is, if the value is smaller, e is smaller, you're going to end up having to take large sample sizes. But if you relax this and allow more error, your uh, sample size is going to reduce, but then you're going to lose the accuracy of your estimation or the uh, yes estimation. Then I have seen uh, that there are some very uh, convenient uh, formulas that students have used. Uh, they pick this from either from the internet. Uh, and But the problem is that they are not wrong, but instances how they use the students how they use these are uh, quite uh, questionable so these are there but when you whenever you see some uh, complicated formulas or tables that gives you sample sizes don't just take them as it is go and uh, try to see what is the uh, basis for such calculation how have they done? When should I use this? For what instances? Because some students go and use this very blindly, uh, even if they are not trying to estimate a proportion. Then they get wrong answers. Sometimes they have done it, but when we try to ask how or uh, how did you come up with this value for E, there is no way they can justify. So don't do that mistake. Right. So uh, I'm just going to go quickly through this. So estimating the mean, again, you have uh, a nice formula. So there are unit, as you have seen in comparison uh, of two populations, we saw the sigma, the same thing is here. So uh, the larger sigmas would give you larger sample sizes, smaller sigmas uh, can uh, make your life easier because you have to take less number of uh, units for your study. Then um, uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> sorry, this is not visible. No? Mm, yeah. Right. So uh, this is a uh, small uh, tweak or what we can say an improvement to uh, the previous uh, formula. So if if you have a finite sample, you don't have, you know, a very large sample from which you draw your uh, uh, large population, pardon me, uh, which from which you are drawing your sample, then you can adjust for that uh, finite sample state, right? Uh, of course, I'm not going to, uh, you can use this, but of course, as the sampling technique changes, uh, the way we calculate e is going to change a little, uh, and that is going to change the overall uh, substitutions that we need to do. But bottom hand is this formula is same as what we saw previously. Right. 
So uh, some aspect that you need to be concerned with sample sizes is that uh, it, it can be very uh, difficult to get precise estimate for sigma or the proportions, right? So please uh, be very careful of uh, giving the values. Don't try to lie or uh, tweak uh, using those values, right? So it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's a different uh, uh, aspect, you know, how to lie with statistics, but don't try to do it because if you uh, play too much with it, uh, for your advantage, what happened is your reproducibility of your research, your validity of your research is going to go down, right? Complicated sampling methods are necessary because you can't do simple random sampling. So when that happens, you have to adjust for that and do the necessary calculations. Uh, sometimes the observations, we want them to be independent. That is the outcome of one observation should not affect the outcome of the other observation. So sometimes that may not be the case. For example, if we are collecting uh, samples from Bere Lake, but they are very close to one another, we know that the same characteristic of this sample may be present or get may get affected uh, in the nearby sam sample. So that may need to be considered, right? Or you have to uh, take it, uh, the po sampling points have to be far apart so that you can say they can be considered as independent, right? Then um, uh, when things get complicated, there are no uh, specific formula you can adopt to calculate the sample size. So in that case, you can go for very complicated simulations uh, but those are available as well. So use the sample size as a guidance, as a as a idea of how many sampling uh, units you need for your study. Right. So you can you don't need to do these calculation by hand. A uh, lot of software, uh, statistical software, do have this sampling. Uh, uh, facility available. I saw that SPSS Minitab also have it, but these are there in latest uh, versions, right? And some web-based tools are there, a lot of web-based tools are there, but when you're using them again, please be cautious, go and study uh, the as, uh, how they are calculated and check whether they can be related to what you are doing. Don't use them blindly. Right. So I'm not going to go deep into analysis because uh, analysis is all about statistics. Really, it's otherwise. So uh, my advice is when you are analyzing, start with uh, descriptive analysis because it allows you to get a very good insight into the data at hand. And you can find unusual observations or patterns. You can uh, reorganize some variables and you can also find missing data. Right. Then uh, what I would like you all to take from advanced analysis is stick to the objective. Whatever the techniques you select, make sure that they can achieve the objective. You can use free packages like R instead of using uh, SPSS uh, that you need to pay, right? And you choose the correct model for the data that you have, right? So you have a, a plethora of models are available. So don't just blindly use them. Check whether they are suitable or they do the analysis that is right for your data. And all of these models have their assumptions. So please take a moment to check whether those assumptions fall for your um, uh, data as well. Because if those assumptions fail, your conclusions are not valid, uh, valid right? I see that not many even attempt to do this part in their research. They just plug in some model, get the results and uh, say uh, the conclusions, state the conclusion. So when you're stating the conclusion, remember if you have done an observational type study, you can only say factors related, don't use the wrong terms affecting, causing impact, right? Uh, and uh, please, make sure that you acknowledge all the limitation. If you have to make assumptions when you're doing your sample size calculation, you need to state them and say, these are my limitations. There's nothing wrong with that, uh, with 
uh, by stating those, again, uh, researchers can identify your limitation and they can improve their selves. Right? With this, I end my talk. I hope I haven't gone beyond the allocated time. Uh, thank you. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Dr. Rasika. That's quite uh, uh, precise in a way of answering a question as I'm um, like sticking to an area that we were asking and then you are delivering. Uh, we have a uh, good number of participants. I wonder whether anyone have some question who can unmute and maybe ask. I hope you won't mind taking up. No, that's okay. Fine. I'll try my best to answer. I think. Uh, if you want, you can drop your uh, questions in the chat as well. Anyone with a question, please? I suppose you can go more move beyond uh, what she really covered. If there's an area, I mean, like in a related area, you can probably ask the question. That's fine. In the interim, you are, uh, um, Dr. Asika, yes. you said um, how to lie with statistics. Uh, <laughs> you just said the sentence in passing, right? Um, yes. And again, in the last one, you said this, don't use some of these words. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, th I think that's quite important because sometimes we pick uh, in our analysis, you always find that uh, students collect a lot of data, but then when it comes to analysis and write up, it becomes quite brief. Yes. You have tons of data, but uh, this analysis area is somewhat not quite strong, right? Um, can you can you give a kind of examples with this? I mean, like this live statistics, if I mean, you have, no. yeah, we all have heard this term lies absolute lies and statistics yes uh, no uh, professor ajit what i uh, actually want to uh, say is that i have seen a lot of uh, even uh, uh, especially like when we are reviewing uh, presentations like abstracts we i see this a lot uh, because uh, the the i see that factors affecting say uh, I'm not quite familiar with engineering uh, related uh, studies, so I'm taking a very uh, general one, like say satisfaction. So uh, what we have done is actually we have uh, collected the satisfaction level of the uh, of our customers and their attributes. We do not know whether one attribute is actually causing the sat satisfaction level. What we can see, you, what we are measuring is a correlation. So we can't say that this is affecting it. What we can say is associated with it. So this is one of the uh, main mistakes or a quite frequent mistake I have seen uh, in not just, you know, uh, uh, in most of the postgraduate uh, students uh, who are doing like MBA or even MSc, uh, they have used this uh, word thinking that uh, my correlations means causation, which is incorrect. So uh, I think, uh, uh, I mean, I'm taking a lot of examples from uh, medical field. So we know that smoking causes lung cancer, but I mean, only few of us would know the real story that went on to establish this, right? Uh, so you, just because you see uh, some people uh, who smoke has uh, more prevalence of cancer, doesn't necessarily mean that it was uh, smoking caused cancer because we don't know whether the person started smoking after they got cancer. We don't know the temporal relationship. So likewise, it's a very, uh, you have to go beyond just correlation to establish something like causation. There's nothing wrong with correlation. It's good that if you can show that these correlation exists because that's the starting point even for causation studies. I hope that is a little bit clearer. Okay. Um, there's a question in the chat. Uh, one question at the moment. If you are to uh, publish in high impact journals, is there any specified statistical software which one has to use? Um, well, it's uh, 
like software like uh, SPSS mini tab and especially uh, in statistics something called SAS is there SAS those are uh, well reputed because they been tested uh, for their analysis and therefore they have more validity than uh, other packages but uh, recently uh, the package R I mean not recently but R is also quite frequently used. The problem with R is that it's freely available and, and the packages are contributed by various people, researchers. So the validity of it uh, might be questioned at some point, but that is also accepted. So I believe uh, sometimes some journals do prefer the if you had used these uh, commercial uh, packages because only reason is they, they are tested and they uh, guarantee for their accuracy. That's why. Same question has uh, whether Minitab 14 is okay? I mean, the versions, uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't uh, pay much attention to the version. The versions uh, will give like uh, latest versions will give you more uh, Better, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, more uh, options of uh, right. an analytical tools are there, but uh, overall, if you're doing uh, some existing old analysis, I mean that any version by Minitab is okay. Right. Um, there are a couple of, but may not be exactly what uh, question of like what are the high impact factor journals? I suppose this is a research student question where are you are you are keen on publishing, but also you are not keen on paying, it's very difficult, we know. Uh, impact uh, factor journals, we can publish research free of charge. I suppose you can mention it in your field. Yes, uh, it's very difficult uh, because from field to field, it's different. Uh, from our perspective, it's, uh, it's becoming really, really difficult to find free ones uh, because if they are free, then they're not having a high impact. Uh, so I, I'm unfortunately I, I don't think there is a uh, one answer I can give. Yeah, I suppose as a research student, if you have uh, you have that issue, you can initially look at uh, a situation like use of uh, intelligent journal finder, mm -hmm. and then uh, following from that journal, then you can see whether it's an open access you have to free or whether it is uh, whether publication fees are there. I suppose that you need to do a little bit of research on that specifically. Yes. Impact fact information out there. Um, there's a question related. Uh, can there be a correlation in between two data sets which does not have significant difference? Correlation while so dif significant difference and correlations are two different things in my opinion. Uh, which, yeah. Okay. So in correlation, what we are trying to say is okay, we have uh, so for you for this you need to have uh, two variables one is x and one is y right uh, so um, uh, so it, it i mean can the, can it be explained what do you mean by two population in there um, is that possible can you unmute and ask the question uh. Yes, madam. If we say, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, if we say I have two data sets, like uh, uh, for few samples, I have water activity readings and color. But mm. uh, when we uh, analyze it statistically, water activity is not significantly affected by color, say, as an example. But when yeah. we plot water activity and color in a graph, there's a a negative correlation like so can it be accepted yes i mean uh, when you have uh, like one thing is when you have large sample size mm -hmm. even a small correlation comes out as significant now the problem is uh, you need to uh, so there are ways you can calculate the correlation like pearson correlation is the uh, simplest one that is quite often used so you have to ask the question, is that a valid uh, statistic you can use? So yours is a color and water activity. Water Maybe activity. More, so yeah. are they measured on continuous scales? Uh, I didn't get it, madam. 
So how do you measure color? Uh, there's a chromometer, specially ah. designed instrument for that. Okay. So then in that case, you can, you could, it's good that you plot it first and see mm -hmm. whether that uh, relationship is first of all linear. Uh -huh. okay. Right. And then uh, you can look at the correlation and any, uh, I suppose you may have run a correlation test and it's not significant. Is that what it is? Yeah, when I uh, did the statistical thing, uh, it was. What, do you not, mean? what uh, is the statistical thing you have done? Uh, uh, when the water activity is decreased with time, there was a reduction in color. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yes, my advice is that uh, I hope you. Uh, uh, calculated the correlation and uh, when you calculate the correlation you can have the correlation test so that would give you whether it's significant or not most of the time the correlation is actually Pearson's correlation and the Pearson correlation works if the relationship is linear now one thing you can try is you can fit a regression model with uh, one of the variable as a response the other as uh, color maybe uh, as the response and uh, water activity. I don't know which one of them you can select uh, uh, depending on the correct a application as a response and fit a regression and see whether that is uh, that X variable becomes significant. That is one of the option. But plot it first and see whether the relationship is linear. Okay. Thank you, madam. Yeah. Three three more questions on the chat line. Hope it's okay, Rasika. Yes, um, yes, sir. Madam, when there is only one population, how can we find out sample size accurately? Yes. Now, yes, sir. Some uh, students say, okay, I have a single population. I have two population. Likewise. So don't think like that. Think about your objective. So what are you trying to do with one population? That's the question you need to ask. Uh, so if you are trying to uh, say, I, I don't know uh, if, if you can unmute, you can say what is your objective? Can you ask so, the question, um, unmuting yourself? We record. Can you hear me? Yes, can we can. Hear me? Yes, yes. I just uh, hypothet hypothetically asked that question. Uh -huh. uh, for instance, uh, assume if we have infinite population. Ah, so infinite, then, yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, for instance, uh, if there is any uh, infinite population, then how can we find out our sample size accurately? Is there is any procedure, is there is any formula? Uh, that's why I see... Uh, so you could see that uh, some of the formulas I have said under survey. Uh, so for example, uh, a formula like this, it's, uh, so what you're basically trying to do is you have your very large population. From that, you take a subsample. So you want to find out how big this sub, uh, sub uh, sample should be, right? A subsection of the population should be. So the thing is, why are you taking the sample? For what purpose is the question that you really need to ask first. So if you're using that sample like uh, to measure the water activity or whatever that uh, uh, researcher had pointed, then you're trying to measure a continuous, uh, you are estimating a continuous measure. Then you're talking about uh, the formula you can use is this one, right? Why? Because uh, this is the formula you would have used to let you know how big your sample needs to be in order to get a good estimate for say water activity or water color measured in a chromome. Uh, I'm sorry if I, so like, well, so it, if your measure is continuous, then you're trying to summarize that continuous measure using the average, right? So how do you estimate the average? Now, if I try to go a little bit more general, let's say I want to estimate the height of uh, uh, 
uh, students who are there studying at FGS. Then what do I do? I can't uh, access, I can't have everybody, I can't meet everybody and measure their height. So what I can do is I can take a sample. So when I take this sample, I need to know how many students I have to uh, measure the height to get an accurate measure for the average height of FGS students. So that deals with a single sample, uh, single population. But I mean, if you don't tell me the objective, it's difficult for me to give the precise answer. Infinite uh, uh, population means you have a, a very large uh, number of units in your population, not like a thousand or ten thousand, but maybe like hundred thousand or millions, like the population in Sri Lanka, like that. But if you have a smaller, uh, about say thousand as your population size, then that's a finite sample, a finite population size. Does that answer your question? Yes, madam. Thank you. Okay. And we are the final, uh, shall we do sample size determination using uh, crazy Morgan. and Morgan table instead of formulas? Yes. Uh, so the is what I showed uh, in one of these slides. So you can use, there's nothing wrong. But the thing is, you have to use it for the correct purpose. Now, if you're trying to estimate a proportion, now you can't use this uh, table or you can't use the, uh, this, uh, sorry, you can't use the table that has used this formula if you're doing a comparative study, right? And you can't uh, very well use this formula if you're trying to measure something like, um, what do you call a, a, a continuous measure or an average? Then you can see what are you going to put for pro probability. So Morgan's table is quite popular because you just look it up from a table and nothing uh, fancy. You don't have to work out a lot, but there's nothing wrong with it. But make sure that it suits what you're doing. That's my answer, I hope. That was okay. I, I, I have a question, like maybe final question. Um, do you have, a, now we see the research students uh, with these problems. Um, you, are, you are specializing in statistics and you can advise on this. But a student entering into a research may not know all these. Mm -hmm. So do you have a, at Colombo uh, something like a stat clinic <laughs> where a research uh, student can come and answer, get answers? Uh, <laughs> So uh, we don't have a, a stack clinic, but we have uh, given our services. Like if anybody wants uh, some advice or want can you know collaborate and work with us, uh, yeah, you can contact uh, one of our lecturers or you can send a drop an email, and we and uh, internally we will try to assist you. But unfortunately, although there is a plan to have a statistical clinic, uh, at the moment we don't have. Okay. I know it's not the ideal answer, but uh, that is there. But we have helped in the past uh, uh, professionals who had wanted uh, help with the uh, sample size calculation or design in surveys like that. Yes, we have even experiments. Thank you, Dr. Rasika. I think uh, we have taken now up uh, from 6.50 and um, we have recorded this uh, presentation so you can revisit. And I think that's on the chat again. Uh, uh, you can use FGS uh, YouTube channel, uh, watch the past sessions also, and this uh, this session will also be upload, uploaded there. So thank you, Professor Ajit, for giving me this opportunity. And I would like to thank uh, Ms. Gimhani as well. So I hope that uh, all, I mean, the participant was able to take something uh, out of this and incorporate into their research. I'm definitely sure about that, Dr. Rasika. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and uh, taking time off to be with us. Thank you. Thank you. And all the participants, a big thank you. Hope you have benefited. And uh, till we meet again, good night. <laughs>